Welcome, good afternoon, and thanks so much for coming to this event on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, so the first question you're probably wondering is why, why did I write this report? What sort of possessed me to, to do it? Um, so my story is that in 2011, I visited detention centres and saw Tamil asylum seekers uh, who were being deported from Britain to Sri Lanka, where many of them faced torture. I didn't understand why the UK government was so determined to be complicit in their torture when the evidence was there in black and white. So, for example, the NGO Freedom From Torture had uh, published reports that documented the risks uh, that Tamil asylum seekers faced uh, on return. So I started uh, researching British foreign policy on Sri Lanka and uh, the Tamil people. I went to the UK National Archives, where Foreign Office files are released to the public after 30 years. I also did lots of Freedom of Information requests. Uh, most of the evidence I'm about to present was hidden from the public, but it does come from official sources. What I found was that Britain had conducted a dirty war against the Tamil people for three decades. Each time the Sri Lankan state looked like it might capitulate to the Tamil resistance movement, the UK recalibrated its level of military and diplomatic support for Colombo to ensure the eventual defeat of the Tamil Tigers. The entire arsenal of Britain's colonial counterinsurgency experience was exported to Sri Lanka. One of my first discoveries was that Britain sent a senior counterinsurgency advisor to Sri Lanka years before the war had really started. I found this out through a couple of freedom of information requests. In 1979, which is four years before the war sort of officially started, in 1979, Britain sent Jack Morton, a former MI5 director, to give the Sri Lankans practical recommendations for the total reorganisation of the intelligence apparatus. He supplied them with a Morton report, which was apparently at the heart of any discussion on Special Branch which in Sri Lanka at that time was called the Intelligence Services Division, part of the police. His report lamented, this is a quote, the depressing picture of apparatus and morale in the security forces tackling the Tamil problem. The Morton report is not available to the public, so to gain some insight into how Morton suggested Sri Lanka should tackle the Tamil problem, we must examine his career path. His memoirs at the British Library reveal that his full name was John Percival Morton, CMG, OBE. And there he is photographed uh, in India. He was born in India to a colonial family. The and in his memoirs, he wrote that the tradition of service in the Raj ran strongly in my family. Gradually it dawned upon me and became deeply ingrained that the British were the rulers of India and that the Indians were a sort of immature, backward and needy people who it was the natural British function to govern and administer. Reflecting on the global scale of the British Empire, Morton wrote, it was inspiring to realise that I was born into this splendid heritage and that to be British was to be a superior sort of person. Morton was a police officer in the Punjab during anti-colonial uprisings in the wake of Gandhi's salt marches. Punjab police shot dead protesters. Morton was a commandant of an armed reserve unit whose role was largely par paramilitary. He then joined the police special branch. He wrote that in one raid on subversives in Amritsar, some revolutionary literature was also recovered, including tracts about the Irish terrorist Michael Collins of Sinn Féin and his guerrilla tactics. I had never previously heard of Michael Collins. The Irish connection and the wider ramifications of the revolutionary movement made a deep impression on me at that time. My interest in special branch matters now quickened. By 1944, he became Lahore's youngest ever police chief, aged 33. At partition, he joined MI5. He later worked as a director of intelligence in Malaya during the emergency, where the police special branch was turned into a counterinsurgency force, apparently at his recommendation. He made an advisory trip to Northern Ireland during the Troubles in 1973 where he advised the police special branch to take over intelligence roles from the army. And Anne will explain in her talk more about what the special branch did in Northern Ireland. So this gives us some idea of what Jack Morton's advice to Sri Lanka in 1979 would have involved. Colonial-style policing, i.e. 
a heavily armed police force with a secret intelligence gathering capability. And in case this wasn't enough, by 1981, so again two years before the so-called start of the war in Sri Lanka, MI5 was spying on Tamil protesters in London because of, according to the files, the importance of Sri Lanka's stability and continued pro-Western alignment. Declassified files at the National Archives show that Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher was briefed about a small group of Tamil residents in London who produced skillful propaganda, but who, according to the Security Service, MI5, have little capacity to mount demonstrations. Despite this hardline British approach, in 1982 the Sri Lankan police were still asking Britain for some fairly tame training courses, such as traffic control. But in early 1983, Sri Lankan police told the British High Commission that it was, quote, baffled by the problems of security and intelligence in the Jaffna area, which is the Tamil stronghold. We have now been told by the Deputy Inspector General of Police that the army and police have been instructed by the President to reorganise their operations in the Jaffna area. They have now turned to this mission for help. Britain's overseas police advisor was quickly dispatched on a special week-long visit to Sri Lanka in March 1983. Sri Lanka's highest-ranking policeman told the British advisor that, quote, Police army rivalry for supremacy in the counter-terrorist field was the greatest stumbling block in respect of which he could see no easy answer. The, the advisor proceeded to explain the organisation of government, police and the army in the counter-terrorist scene in Northern Ireland. The British advisor also commended the lessons to be learned from the Morton Report of 1979 and suggested that an MI5 officer visit Sri Lanka to further the aims of the Morton Report. By the end of this meeting, Sri Lanka's police chief wanted to speak to senior British officials about the role of police in internal security vis-à-vis -vis the military, and get a special briefing on the role of police military in Northern Ireland. Secret visits to Belfast were duly arranged, including for Sri Lanka's top cops. In April 1983, a month after the advisor's trip, Sri Lankan diplomats wrote to the British police with a new list of training requirements. The change in priorities from the letter of 1982 is stark. The two top items on the list for police training were paramilitary courses for counterinsurgency operations and commando operations training. So you can see how, within a very short time scale, the Sri Lankan police have gone from wanting help with traffic control to thinking that the police should have paramilitary training. The Foreign Office commented that these courses are, quote, of some political sensitivity and extremists in Sri Lanka could be expected to co complain bitterly that Britain was assisting in the training of the Sinhalese authorities in order that they could continue their policies of repression of the legitimate rights and aspirations of the Tamil people in the country. As you know, we should like to help the Sri Lankan government discreetly as much as we can with these courses. By May 1983, the Sri Lankan police, not the army, wanted British training to cover paramilitary operations, counter-terrorist techniques, guerrilla warfare and internal security duties for police officers who would be responsible for, quote, the training and administration of a paramilitary unit to be set up here. And that's a photograph from one of the UK files. This is a clear reference to the nascent special task force, which you'll hear about later from Tamil uh, and Sinhalese speakers who've directly experienced the horrors of the Special Task Force. What is remarkable here is that the police in Northern Ireland had recently set up a paramilitary unit for counter-terrorist operations. Under a policy called Police Primacy, Bobbies on the Beat were turned into elite soldiers. The unit was trained by the SAS to use firepower, speed and aggression, and it was a complete disaster. Six months before the Sri Lankan police requested similar training, the unit had shot dead six Catholic men in four weeks over November and December 1982. The police riddled one car with 109 bullets. Its occupants were unarmed. This led to allegations that Northern Ireland's police had a shoot-to-kill policy, where terror suspects were assassinated rather than arrested and put on trial. These shootings became known as the Stalker Affair after Detective John Stalker, who investigated the killings, and faced a cover-up from special branch officers who controlled the unit. Stalker compared the unit to, quote, a Central American assassination squad. It is remarkable, then, that an almost identical unit was set up in Sri Lanka months later, after all this British advice from Northern Ireland. Did Britain export a police death squad? 
The evidence strongly suggests that this is what happened. For more details on this episode, um, I'm putting an updated version of the report online today. It's called uh, Exporting Police Death Squads from Armagh to Trincomalee, and it's sort of an update to the Dirty War Report, all about the 1980s. Um, so Sri Lanka's Police Special Task Force was trained by British mercenaries who were ex-SAS soldiers. Again, the SAS had trained the unit in Northern Ireland, and former SAS were training the Special Task Force in Sri Lanka. The first batch of uh, Special Task Force reportedly included Kapila Jayasakira, who went on to command the Trinko 5 shootings two decades later, which are a very familiar massacre to Tamil people. The UK government denied sending the mercenaries, but now we know from the declassified files they wanted to help with police commando training discreetly. That's a photo there of what's believed to be former British SAS personnel training the Special Task Force in Sri Lanka. The mercenaries in Sri Lanka also flew helicopter gunships on live missions. One of the British pilots wrote in his biography that, in five months, I had been personally involved in the death of 152 tigers, Tamil tigers. Well, to be totally accurate, at 152, I had given up counting. Junior army officers were also trained by the mercenaries. I met one of the instructors, a former SAS soldier, who had taken part in the famous Iranian embassy siege. He told me that they taught standard Northern Ireland internal security programmes and standard infantry tactics to the Sri Lankans, and the same psychological interrogation techniques as used by the British Army in Northern Ireland. These were two stress positions. One, standing against a wall with arms outstretched, leaning on fingertips, and two, a ski position, as well as pudding, white noise, and what he called humiliation. He says they told the Sri Lankan soldiers not to use physical torture. However, troops trained by the mercenaries ignored his, avo his advice and carried out atrocities, such as putting burning tyres around the necks of captured Tamils. Still, the interrogation techniques they taught were supposed to have been banned by the British government in the 1970s, and the Irish government said that they amounted to torture. Anne will explain more about this case in her presentation. The photograph in the slide shows a British soldier in Iraq putting hooded detainees in stress positions, so the techniques have clearly not gone away. The veteran I met also named Brian Beatty as the top British mercenary in Sri Lanka. This reveals a calibre of British counterinsurgency expertise that was being exported. Beatty had been a soldier in the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders, a regiment that was deployed to most of Britain's post-war counterinsurgency campaigns. Palestine, Guyana, Cyprus, Borneo, Aden and then Northern Ireland. We know that Beatty served in the jungles of Borneo, where he was awarded the Military Medal for ambushing Indonesian soldiers. After Borneo, Beatty served as an officer in Aden, where the Argyles were commanded by the notorious Mad Mitch. The New Statesman magazine claimed that Beatty was one of Mad Mitch's special interrogators in Aden, where the torture of suspects by the British Army was prolific. And again, Anne will touch more on this in her presentation after me. Beatty then joined the SAS, and was the commanding officer of the elite SAS squadron deployed to South Armagh in 1976, tasked with fighting some of the deadliest IRA operators. Years later, the IRA tried to assassinate Beatty by post posting a bomb through his letterbox in Hereford. It failed. So, the man who led the secret war against the IRA in South Armagh took the fight to the Tamil Tigers ten years later. The British mercenary company in Sri Lanka was called KMS Limited. KMS's directors included two former commanders of SAS regiment and a deputy head of SAS intelligence. One of them was the son of a Ceylon tea planter. KMS was short for Kini Mini Services, which is meant to be a Swahili phrase suggesting the movement of a snake in the grass that was borrowed by Frank Kitson during the Mau Mau uprising in Kenya to describe Kitson's counterinsurgency concept of pseudo gangs. These were white policemen, so in the photograph on the right, that's apparently a white policeman, dressed African style with faces blackened, who accompanied teams of turned ex-terrorists into the bush. The idea of deception and facade is powerful imagery for understanding KMS's modus operandi. Was KMS really a private company, or was it just a mask worn by the British state to carry out deniable operations? 
During the 1980s, the relationship between KMS and the British government was the subject of controversy. One investigative journalist went as far as calling KMS the military wing of MI6, implying that the company operated under direct control of UK intelligence. Newly declassified Weichel documents reveal that KMS did enjoy a unique position with the British state. By 1980, the company had a monopoly on supplying bodyguards for UK diplomats around the world. When Margaret Thatcher questioned if this job should be done by British soldiers or by other firms instead of KMS, her cabinet was told, there is only one British firm which the security service, MI5, consider suitable, KMS Limited. Isn't it extraordinary that British intelligence only trusted one company to guard the embassies? I have found another example of KMS's special relationship with the British state, tucked away in a foreign office file on Uganda, which covers events immediately after the fall of Idi Amin. A secret memo reveals that the new president was interested in, quote, acquiring British experts to train a presidential protection unit in Kampala. And then there's a lot of the document blacked out. It is obviously in our interest to help him, but the appointment of a British citizen to undertake this task in Kampala could attract press interest. And then more of the document is blacked out. On balance, I recommend that blank should be authorised to offer help if approached, e.g. in steering the Ugandans in the direction of a suitable candidate, but only on the strictest conditions such assistance should remain absolutely confidential and that there should be no public recognition of the involvement of British personnel in training of the Ugandan Presidential Protection Unit had been arranged or endorsed by the British government. Although the redactions are inconvenient, there are handwritten notes at the bottom of the page which have escaped the censor's attention. A Foreign Office official responded the next day with, I agree, we might discuss at this afternoon's meeting. There are obvious pitfalls and advantages. The latter outweigh the former. And a note below that, later that same day, reads, We discussed. The question is being handled by KMS without any official involvement by us. There is no action we need to take at present. Isn't it remarkable that within one day of the Foreign Office running into a potentially awkward situation, KMS appeared on the scene? The impression one gleans from these British government files about KMS is that the company enjoyed a unique position of trust when it came to protecting British interests abroad. Although KMS vanished in the 1990s, another company, Saladin Security, claims to be its successor. And you can go on its website and it says that. According to documents at Company's House, Saladin is still run by the same businessman who controlled KMS in the 1980s, SAS veteran Major David Walker. The company even uses the same South Kensington office today as KMS did in the 1980s, from where Walker sent his men to set up and train Sri Lanka's special task force. This raises the question of corporate accountability for atrocities against the Tamils. But the British state might be culpable as well if it can be proven that KMS was in fact its proxy. Although direct lines of control from the British state to KMS are deliberately hard to prove, there is an interesting political connection that must be highlighted. One of the directors of Saladin from 1993 to 1997 was Archibald Hamilton, MP, who had served as a defence minister from 1986 to 1993 during some of KMS's time in Sri Lanka. Hamilton now sits in the House of Lords. British involvement in Sri Lanka did not end there. Other sources claim that when the Indian peacekeeping force intervened from 1987 to 1990, it was advised by an SAS officer. Meanwhile, the Sri Lankan president was advised on defeating the Sinhalese JVP uprising by British counterinsurgency experts Major General Clutterbuck, a veteran of Malaya. In the 1990s, rather than use mercenaries, Britain gave formal military training. Distinguished Tamil journalist Sivaram said that until 1997, the cream of Sri Lankan Army Officers Corps was trained in the UK. Sivaram also said that from 1995, the British defence attaché in Colombo had first-hand experience in Ireland and Oman. He was a protégé of Frank Kitson, the father of modern counterinsurgency techniques. And Dr. Takriti will tell us more about British counterinsurgency in Oman later this afternoon. In 1997, Britain was instrumental in creating a new military academy in Sri Lanka called the Army Command and Staff College for senior officers. Almost 50 years after so-called independence, a British colonel, John Field, CBE, was permanently attached to the college for the next few years. 
This photograph shows how senior a role Plenelfield held at the college. There he is sitting in the front row. The curriculum was based on the British system and designed for senior officers from all branches of the armed forces. Counterinsurgency, as applied to the situation in Sri Lanka, was a key component during Colonel Field's tenure. Among the first batch of students was a young Kamal Gunaratna. He is pictured behind the British colonel in the photograph there. During the final stage of the war in 2009, Major General Kamal Gunaratna was at the heart of the killing fields. He was a general officer command of the 53rd Division, which reportedly killed the Tamil female journalist Isapriya. Despite all this training, the Tamil Tigers made huge gains in territory and began to negotiate for a ceasefire from a position of strength. However, in February 2001, the British Home Secretary, Jack Straw, announced that the LTTE, the Tamil Tigers, would be included on a list of organisations that were to be banned under new anti-terrorist legislation. This was before 9-11 and should not be conflated with the global war on terror paradigm. Something else was at work here. In July 2001, the Tigers demonstrated their military superiority with a devastating attack on the island's international airport. This could have caused insurance premiums to rocket, but Lloyds of London sent a crack team led by notorious British mercenary Tim Spicer for a tour of the island's sensitive uh, trade hubs. In this way, serious economic pressure caused by the LTTE's attack was mitigated. And you can see from that list of who was in Tim Spicer's team all the experience that they had in UK Special Forces. Tim Spicer's security re review continued into early 2002, by which point the Sri Lankan government had agreed to the LTTE's offer of a ceasefire, albeit <coughs> with a considerably strengthened hand. So, what happened to the ceasefire? And what did Britain do? A retired UK Army officer, General Sir Michael Rose, was hired as an advisor to the Sri Lankan government from 2002 to 2004, under contract from Control Risks Group, a British private security firm. Rose assisted with Sri Lanka's defence review. He, comment he commended the army, this is a quote, for fighting bravely, but noted that too often it had seen victory turn to defeat. When the ceasefire was signed, Rose said that the tactical initiative was being lost and that the capability of the LTT had become, in some respects, superior to those of the Sri Lankan armed forces. The reasons given by Rose were a lack of intelligence, failure in the policy of static defence, inadequate equipment and poor administration. He says they resulted in, quote, a lack of confidence among many of the middle and lower ranked members of the armed forces with regards to their political management and senior military leadership. The depth of Michael Rose's expertise in British counterinsurgency must be emphasised. He was born in India in 1940 and saw active service in Aden during the anti-colonial revolt. Rose was in Derry in Bloody Sunday in 1972 when British soldiers from another unit shot dead 14 unarmed civil rights protesters. Rose later told the Savile Inquiry into these killings that the IRA had opened fire first. Rose joined the SAS and was reportedly deployed to Oman and Northern Ireland. He became commander of 2-2 SAS and was in charge of the SAS men who famously stormed the Iranian embassy in 1982. Later, he was appointed the UK's first director of special forces. Britain contributed politically and military, militarily to the breakdown of the 2002 ceasefire agreement by distorting the balance of power in favour of the Sri Lankan government. Despite the truce, Britain continued to train, advise and equip the Sri Lankan military, police and intelligence agencies. Colin Martin, OBE, who was the British defence advisor in Colombo from 2004 to 2007, said that during his tenure, he, quote, instigated a comprehensive training and development programme for the Sri Lankan armed forces. A freedom of information request, as I did, obtained a list of all the courses provided by the UK Ministry of Defence to the Sri Lankans in 2007. The list runs to two pages. You can see it there in the, in the report. Also at this time, one of the Sri Lankan president's sons was trained as a naval officer by the Royal Navy in Britain. Diplomatically as well, the UK was playing dirty. Britain has a privileged position as a permanent member of the UN Security Council and could have scheduled a resolution against Sri Lanka during the genocidal mass atrocities of 2009. However, Sir John Sawyers, the UK permanent representative to the UN, said in late 2009 that, quote, 
The LTTE is a terrorist organisation prescribed by many countries, including the UK. They are corners and under pressure, and the solution to the current situation is the LTTE laying down arms. The UK has a clear position that Sri Lanka is not on the agenda of the UN Security Council, and this is not that kind of situation. Throughout the final six months of armed conflict, the Foreign Office secretly deepened its ties with the Sri Lankan police, <coughs> even as the Foreign Secretary David Miliband publicly demanded the Sri Lankan government allow greater humanitarian access to displaced Tamil civilians. I found that in February 2009, the Foreign Office sent a delegation of senior Northern Irish police commanders to Colombo as, quote, critical friends at a time in the conflict when even hospitals had been shelled by Sri Lankan forces. One of the UK police officers had also advised the Americans in Iraq. Full disclosure about this, about this liaison has been refused five years later. The final section of the report looks at Britain's motive for doing all of this and identifies the geostrategic location of Sri Lanka in the centre of Indian Ocean trade routes. Now, Barshner will talk a bit more about this, I think, in his presentation, but that's a photograph of the UK Defence Secretary, Liam Fox, arriving in Colombo in 2011 for a speech. And this photograph is famous because of the man in the purple tie at the back that was Adam Verity, and that became a big scandal because Liam Fox hadn't publicly declared his interest with Adam Verity. But if you actually look at what Liam Fox said in that speech, he said, Sri Lanka is located in a pivotal position in the Indian Ocean. And this is something that you see in Foreign Office and Ministry of Defence files over and over again. So to my mind, that is Britain's um, strategic interest in Sri Lanka. Since 2009, there has been little change in British policy on Sri Lanka in terms of deportations, repression and collusion. Thousands of police are still being trained by the UK and the contract could be renewed in just 10 days' time. And we're hoping to start a, peti a petition to call on the police training contract not to be renewed. We might talk about that more later today. So, I have some closing thoughts about counter and counter insurgency. Machiavelli said, my enemy's enemy is my friend. Well, in 2009, Britain was Sri Lanka's critical friend. What does this mean for the Tamils? My enemy's critical friend is my enemy. The report shows that both Labour and Conservative supported the unitary Sri Lankan state for decades in the full knowledge of the genocidal atrocities that it was carrying out against the Tamils. This suggests that Whitehall is the real power behind the parties when it comes to foreign policy. And by Whitehall, I mean the Foreign Office, the Ministry of Defence and the intelligence agencies. I know Tamil groups are lobbying Tories and Labour, but why lobby a puppet when you can cut the master's strings? Whitehall is threatened by Scottish independence and Irish unity. What happens to the UK's nuclear submarines, UN Security Council seats, and even British embassies abroad if Scotland separates? Are the Scottish National Party and Sinn Féin, who are both riding high in the polls, better allies for the Tamils? Would the Scottish and Irish governments be more likely to support the Tamil right to self-determination than the UK government? These are just some questions and things for people to think about later. It is also important to recover the truth and deter future abuse. I believe the Tamils deserve a public inquiry into UK collusion and the Tamil genocide. There is also a case for prosecuting the mercenary companies and their political masters. Otherwise, what is there to stop them from doing it to you again? Thank you.